Okay, it's time to begin the last, possibly the best, session of Popple on gradual, type, gradual typing and verification. Uh, my name is Ron Garcia uh, from University of British Columbia, but let me uh, hand it off to Cesar Andrici, uh, who will tell us about securing verified I.O. programs against unverified code in F-Star. Thank you. Can you hear me? No? Oh, ah, uh, no. Okay, hello, I'm Cesar Andrich, and today I'll present to you joint work with many great collaborators. In this paper, we devised a secure compilation framework that allows us to link verified code against unverified code securely. We do this for a star, but the problem that we treat is much more general. It's a problem that exists in all proof-oriented languages. Um, so in a proof-oriented language, we can write a program write a specification, and then verify that the program satisfies the specification. For example, we can verify that the web server responds to every request. We can do that by taking the specification, annotating the code using refinement types, and annotating functions with uh, pre and post conditions, and then the language has a tool that will uh, verify if the annotations uh, are satisfied. And if the verification succeeds, then it gives us a strong guarantee that the program satisfies the specification. So we like the strong guarantees, and for these strong guarantees, proof-oriented languages were used to verify an increasing number of realistic applications. These are just a few of them that uh, we can use today, and uh, they actually are used, and some of them um, were integrated in the tools like uh, Firefox or Windows, and here I refer to the cryptographic primitives from EverCrypt or uh, EverParse. And what can we learn from these uh, projects is that uh, most often the verified code is linked with unverified code. And still, in, with such a mix, with such a hybrid setting, we still want strong guarantees. But what happens in practice is that most often the specification of the unverified code is assumed. And this is bad because none of the proof-oriented languages offer any guarantees that these specifications are satisfied. Uh, so this can be easily unsound, and if the code is untrusted, it can be also insecure because the code can be buggy or malicious. So this is not what we want. And the alternative is to convert the assumptions into dynamic checks and to enforce the assumptions on the unverified code. Uh, and to get our strong guarantees, we want a solution that is verified. So in this paper, we look at this problem through the lenses of secure compilation. So our solution is called SCIO STAR. It's a verified secure compilation framework that dynamically converts, uh, dynamically enforces the assumed specification. And it allows us to link verified code against unverified code securely even if the code is adversarial. Uh, in this work, we assume that uh, the two are in the same language, but one is annotated with pre and post conditions and one is not. This is to make all assumptions explicit, but nevertheless, we have to enforce the assumptions. Um, so our framework uses two methods, two techniques to enforce these assumptions. The first one is adding higher order contracts during compilation. So what happens during compilation is that the functions that interact with the unverified code are wrapped into new functions that have dynamic checks before and after each call. And these are great to enforce assumptions made about arguments or return values. For example, that the file descriptor passed as argument is open or that a return, uh, a return string was read from a file. Um, however, this technique is not enough. We need a second technique. And to give you an example of why, so this higher order contract exists exist at the boundary between verified code and unverified code. So, um, we add the, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, imagine that the verified code calls into unverified code, and the unverified code has a missile. It can launch that missile, it gives us back control, and then we have to run a dynamic check to do what? To find out that uh, they launched the missile, it's too late, right? So what we do is we have a second technique 
uh, we use a second technique that adds a reference monitor during clinking. And this reference monitor enforces an access control policy on the unverified code to prevent any bad things from happening. And these two, our sec okay, so with these two techniques, our com uh, secure compilation framework gives us a resulting application that visually looks like this, where the verified code interacts with the unverified code through higher order contracts, and then there is the reference monitor. The reference monitor records everything that happens in both parts, but it for and in its internal state, and it uses that internal state to enforce the access control policy on the unverified code. Also, the higher order contracts also have access to the state to be able to enforce more explicit assumptions, but they cannot update the state of the monitor. Uh, all of this is mechanized in F-star, so we were able to prove a soundness theorem that asserts that if we have a, a piece of code that is verified with respect to a global safety property, then using our compilation framework, we can link that secure against any unverified code. Um, right. So with this soundness theorem, and because everything is mechanized, we give get our strong guarantees back, and this is great. So our uh, a uh, high-level picture looks like this. SCIO star right now supports terminating higher-order I.O. programs. By I.O. programs, we mean programs that can open files, write to them, read from them, close them, open sockets, etc. And by higher-order, we mean that uh, the verified code and the unverified code communicate through a higher-order interface, which means they can send callbacks to each other, and thanks to our framework, they can do this securely. Um, right. Uh, one more thing, uh, in our framework, uh, both the verified code can have initial control, and we also support the setting where the unverified code has initial control. Uh, we proved our secure compilation criteria in both cases. So to make this solution possible, we bring a few contributions. The first one is a new way to verify terminating I.O. programs um, that benefits from SMT automation. The second is a compilation framework that converts systematically assumptions into dynamic checks. To our knowledge, our solution is the first to be verified. And also, we prove about our compilation framework a secure compilation criteria that is uh, one of the strongest. It's even stronger than full abstraction. So let's start with the first. Uh, this is a toy example. If you want a better example, please look in the paper. We have a very nice uh, case study of a web server. Uh, so how to verify an I.O. program? We, here we have verifprog. It's a function, um, it's a function that takes as argument another function called libparse. And the body of the function is only three lines. Um, it is, it opens data.csv, it takes the file descriptor, it passes this file descriptor to libparse, and then it closes the file descriptor. So to verify such a, or such a program in F star, we have to use monadic effects and use monadic effects to type uh, this program. Here we use MIO, our own effect, and this allows us to write preconditions, here indicated by requires, it's a trivial precondition. And then we, uh, we also write a post condition indicated by ensures, um, and this post condition states that if this program opens a file, then this file is data.csv. So basically it allows this program to only open one file, and to do the other operation. So this is just an example. And what MIO allows us to do is to write pre and post conditions over traces. What that means is that for each I operation, there is an event associated with it. For example, for open file, we have E open file. For close, we have E close. And uh, we, we see that these events also have uh, the arguments and the result values of the operations. And we have this whole for libparse. So here it becomes obvious that we have to um, we have to make some assumptions about libparse to be able to verify the post condition against this local trace. Uh, so these events are put together into a local trace, and the post condition is verified against it. Uh, also, I would like to mention that um, because this post condition is over traces. And you can see that it also characterizes the behavior of the program, but also of libparse. This is a global safety property for the entire thing, 
when the Verif proc has initial control. Um, and also, I would like to iterate why it's so important to enforce these assumptions. It's very easy to write an unverified lib parse that just opens a password file and sends the data over sockets. So while we allow linking with such programs, we want to prevent the bad behavior of it. So the way we make assumptions about lib parse is by typing lib parse with a type that has pre and post conditions, and we call this a strong type. So we can give a precondition to lib parse that, for example, the file descriptor uh, given as argument is open, and we give it the post condition <coughs> that the return value was read from the file descriptor. These two, pre, uh, these two can be enforced using higher order contracts because they are about the uh, argument and the return value. Um, however, we need a second post condition that is about the behavioral lib parse, and this post condition blocks lib parse from opening any file. And this has to be enforced by the reference monitor, and actually this second post condition becomes our access control policy denoted here by sigma. <laughs> now that we saw how we write our assumptions, let's see how we convert them into dynamic checks. Um, so here is the same diagram again, but now we have the example on uh, each UPC. So we have the verified program that expects a lib parse that has a strong type, but we have a lib parse that has a weak type that doesn't have a precondition or a postcondition. So our secure compilation framework bridges this gap, um, uh, bridges this gap using the two techniques, and there is this middle point we call an intermediate type. Um, so the first thing that happens is that compilation takes the program and makes the program to expect a library with an intermediate type, and then the reference monitor, by enforcing an access control policy, actually gives a bit of specification to the library. So let's focus only on the types. So here is the same diagram simplified. We have the strong type that has refinements, pre and post conditions. Uh, what the higher order contracts do is that they will wrap this function into a new one and convert almost all the assumptions, all the specification, into dynamic checks except uh, the post condition, uh, except the part of the specification that's access the access control policy, right? Because the higher contracts cannot enforce that. So, um, from a we okay. So all, all the rest of the assumptions are enforced using higher order contracts. Uh, from a weak type to a intermediate type, I cannot show you exactly the structure of the weak type. I can just give you intuition here. It's a type that doesn't have any concrete specification, but the intuition is very simple. If we have a function of this type and we have a reference monitor that enforces an access control policy on it, then we can give this access, uh, we can write as a post condition that this program satisfied the access control policy, right? If we have a program enforced access control policy, then we can state that the program satisfies the access control policy. All right. So these are uh, the simplest. Uh, the simplest. These are uh, the way we uh, translate between types. And now I would like to uh, talk about uh, our secure criteria. Um, so we prove about our compilation framework one of the strongest secure compilation criteria. It, it, uh, it is called robust relation hyperproperty preservation. It is shown to be stronger than full abstraction. Uh, it, oops. So here, prog is our verified program, and context is the unverified code. With red is in the target, with blue is in the source. So what it says is that for any uh, piece of unverified code that exists, uh, let's, let me read it again. For any unverified context, there exists a verified context such that for all verified programs, if we 
uh, check the behavior of the pro compiled program linked with the unverified code equals the behavior in the source of the verified program linked with verif verified code. And uh, this criterion is usually very hard to prove in the literature, uh, but our proof is by construction, and this is because we put a lot of effort into uh, having two shallow embeddings that help with our proof, and also because we specialize the design of our higher order contracts uh, to help with the proof to make it by construction. The proof and other definitions are in the paper, and I would like to reiterate that uh, there is a very nice case study of a simple web server that was written and verified in FSTAR, and also compiled and secured with SCI FSTAR, our framework. Thank you. Okay, questions? Hi, um, nice work. So, um, uh, do you support uh, mutually distrusting um, programs? Uh, what do you mean by mutually distrusting? So, so suppose uh, libparse also tries to protect itself from its uh, no, I mean, we are only interested in protecting from uh, unverified code. We don't really do it the other way. We don't do it the other way. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Uh, when you uh, indicate that this is approved by construction, do you mean for every unverified context, you can actually generate as an algorithm to generate the verified context? Yes, we defined the back translation function from an unverified context to a verified context. Okay, yeah, thank you. So I had a similar question here. Um, it's about back translation. Do you prove that that blue context that exists is somehow equivalent to the red one? Because otherwise I'm worried that if you do something funky, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know you're doing a back translation, so you have a way of generating this, but if I just look at the theorem statement, it seems to say that you could get crafty and come up with some sort of blue context that somehow compensates for certain behavior, like if it knows weird things about the compiler or about the monitors. Um, technically speaking, that theorem had stated, if it doesn't say that the red CTX and the blue CTX are equivalent, it feels like there's some danger that's possible based on only the theorem statement, though I understand that your proof is by construction, therefore if I go look at the way the proof is done, it probably, that worry goes away. What, what would you say to that? Uh, I mean, what I can say is that it's proven that this criterion is stronger than full abstraction. Now, you say that uh, it needs uh, some kind of um, other, condition to relate the context in the target with the context in the source. Uh, I see. So you have a theorem that says that this implies full abstraction. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. proved in uh, Abate et, et al. in CSF 2019. Okay. Maybe we can talk about it offline because I'm wondering how that proof goes. <laughs> okay. Um, Hello. Um, have you measured the overhead of the adding these verification and annotations? Uh, no. Like the runtime overhead, I mean. No. We do not deploy all the solutions that exist in literature. For example, soft contract verification that will eliminate some of the contracts. But we put a lot of effort into ensuring that we enforce only the required dynamic checks. And also, our, uh, our framework is uh, parameterized by the monitor state. So when one uh, does the compilation, can choose the state of the monitor so that it is as uh, uh, small as necessary, as minimal as necessary. Um, so we did some effort into uh, making things better, but we did not uh, run any benchmarks. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, who writes activities monitors and what language can that person use? 
so it has to use uh, F star, and uh, the person that does the compilation has to. Uh, so that person could actually inject effects into the monitor, like open the file itself. Mm, so is there protection against effects in the if in in the contract? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the contracts are not uh, the con. No, sorry, not the higher contract. The monitor. Are there, uh, can the monitor have effects, on, or do you have contracts on the monitor that can have eliminate these effects? Because if you full, if you use full F star, that can happen. So in F, F star, the supports effects, right, and it will check uh, what effects a function has. Uh, so for the contracts, it's uh, they cannot produce effects except uh, some minimal uh, related to the monitor itself. And uh, for the monitor, uh, one can only choose the state of the monitor, not the way the state is updated or uh, accessed. Let's thank our speaker.